Okie dokie. Oh. A podcast for those addicted to the study of scripture. Welcome fellow addicts, this is your safe place to OD. Here I am. What are we going to talk about today? Today we are talking about the Gospels. This is Gospels part 125. We are still within the midst of this, you could say, Last Supper interaction between Jesus and the disciples who are left, uh, excluding Judas Iscariot right now. Um, And... Jesus has been saying a lot of things to his disciples before they wrap up the Passover Seder and actually leave the home or building that they were performing that Seder in. And last week we saw where Jesus was connecting the love of God with the keeping of his commandments. Yeah, He seems to reiterate that concept over and over in his ministry, and he's reminding his disciples here again in John chapter 14, Uh, But he adds this little bit about this dynamic of after he leaves, so to speak, of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, that there's going to be a helper that's going to come for his followers, uh, the Spirit. And the Spirit adds to that dynamic of loving God and keeping the commandments by helping remembrance of the commandments, or it is an aid in teaching you as you study God's scripture and word and try to apply it to your lives. Yeah. And in some ways, Jesus, I can't remember if it's in this section or in a section later, Jesus kind of even iterates that it's better for him to go in some ways because of the spirit coming into the picture to be able to interact with us and spur us on to love and good deeds. Yeah. Yeah. It's another way that hey, look, he was just one single person in one single place at one point in time. And obviously, when this gets spread across, quote unquote, his body, well, that's benefit for Mm -hmm. all of creation. So yeah, yeah, it's a good one, Samuel. And he he ended last week with kind of giving a little mini priestly blessing. There's connections to numbers. And then at the end of this section in John 14 he says rise let us go from here and then it seems like they're getting ready to change scenes yeah so end of the farewell discourse psych (laughs) it it really does seem like an ending but John has either I guess it depends on how you look at it it's either a continuation or uh, a second version of it it's actually going to cover the next three chapters and you know what we're going to find I don't know much some of what was in the recently concluded farewell discourse well it's just going to get repeated uh sometimes we might find an expanded version so we have something more to talk about sometimes it's a contracted version and here's another thing about it samuel this is this is strange everything in that first discourse seemed like it flowed well together right In this one, it seems like it's kind of broken up, sometimes maybe even like it gets a little disordered, switched in and out of place. Is John, the author, doing that on purpose so that he's trying to point things out? Or is this just the, the, what would we call them, the editors (laughs) who are trying to put all this together? Did they just put a bunch of scrap pieces in because they related, they sounded similar? We just don't know. It's kind of odd. It's kind of unexplainable. And and many have tried to explain it many different ways, and I'm just going to save everybody the trouble. We're not going to try to explain it. We're just going to go ahead and go through it, just accept it. It's in the text, and we're just going to try to get what's in there out, try to figure out what's being communicated for our benefit. So are you ready? Let's do it. All right. We are in John chapter 15. We're first going to look at a section that is verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. 
Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Okay. Sounds like a lot of repeat. Sounds like, uh, well, I don't know, parts of this almost sound like a parable or, or maybe an explanation of a parable or something. But I don't know. There's a lot in here. Let's zip through it quick as we can, because again, some of it's repeated. So start out, God is the vine dresser. And so what does the vine dresser want? Well, he wants the most and the best fruit. And so, Samuel, good question for you. What is this fruit we are speaking of? Um, his people bearing his image. Yeah, and uh, righteousness is another way of saying it. Righteousness is that good fruit. And now, obviously, he's talking about what kind of real fruit, Samuel? A vine and a vine dresser. Uh, Grapes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was something much more esoteric than that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. He's just talking about grapes. And and honestly, we can understand a vine dresser. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get that vine, those branches, to fulfill their very goal and purpose. And I mean, you know, if we could sort of humanize a vine for a second, he's trying to make them feel as though they've reached their potential, they've fulfilled their purpose, right? All of those kinds of things. Now, now back to the metaphor. Jesus is the true vine, and what we mean by that is that there is no sin in him. And remember, this is another I am statement. I think this is number nine. I am the true vine. Jesus is the true vine, and Samuel, this vine, this is also very interesting, a vine exists in a vineyard. Who's the vineyard? We've talked about this a bunch of times. It's got to be the nation of Israel as a whole. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and that's uh, one example. You could take that from Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. So think about that. Jesus is not replacing Israel. He is a part of Israel. And in some sense, he represents all of Israel or the best of Israel. Now, just as a side note, I know we're in John and that we're we're not treating this as a Seder while we're in John. It's just a supper together. But, you know, because the other synoptics treat it like one, just to point this out, this could be, all of this might have been said with the blessing of the fourth cup. Uh, it's blessed are you, you know, who creates the fruit of the vine, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. Now, again, we don't know that, but that would be a really appropriate place for it to fit. So, let's think about this, Samuel. Apparently, it's possible for a person to be a branch that is in him, in the vine, but that does not bear fruit. And we just said that was righteousness. And what does it say? God will take that branch away. Let that sink in. We, na we may not be able to preci precisely define the parameters here, whatever's really going on, but it's a real thing. There is a branch. It's in him, but it's not bearing fruit, and God takes it away. Now, people can argue about it, but for me, that's one of those where the once saved, always saved, perseverance of the saints, whatever. I don't know. That's trouble for me. This seems like it kind of goes against that some, but whatever. People can you know, they, they, they've got their own way of viewing these things. Now, it's also possible that a person is a branch that is in him, and it does bear fruit. But even for that person, God wants to maximize production. 
this person may in fact be achieving some level of righteousness and i don't even want to say on their own just you know d- d- trying to walk with god holy spirit the whole thing some level of righteousness but god prunes that branch and i think we could all collectively say ouch whatever that is it's probably going to be uncomfortable And all it is is to say he's removing a lot of the superfluous green part of the vine, the unneeded areas of our lives, so that more or all of the energy of the plant can go toward the fruit. That is an awesome image. you got to get that in your head. That is what you are called to. That is what you are destined for, right? All of those things. So great, great imagery. We've talked about this uh, in the earlier discourse. Already you are clean. They've been made pure in some sense, ready for attachment to the vine, or they are in fact attached to the vine. And remember, this goes back to the foot washing scene that we had. You're already clean, but not all of you, that thing. But this purity... It comes through the word. What word? God's word. And, I mean, Jesus spoke it. That was one thing. But also, Jesus lived it by example. And, I mean, let's go back to chapter 1 of John. Jesus is it. The word of God. So, in Torah, this is an interesting side point. The first three years of a grapevine are considered unclean. You're not supposed to eat it. It gets three years to sort of grow on its own before you really start harvesting from it. How interesting that Jesus has been with them for three years. Hmm. And they are now clean. And they can begin harvesting that righteousness. I I just think that's super awesome. But anyway, let's go on. Uh, Jesus focuses uh, on another, I think it's just a hugely important point. They must abide in him. That is to say, they have to remain stable and fixed. And of course, when I say they, I think we can very easily extrapolate that out to us, we. And that's the secret to fruit bearing. In fact, Jesus says, you can't even bear any fruit unless you abide in him. So, I mean, we're going to address this, uh, but we're going to, we'll also come back to the abiding thing, though. Remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples But again, I think it's reasonable. I think it's expected that we should be extending this to us. Now, here's the thing. It says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Samuel, take a guess. Do you think that in the middle of this talk that Jesus is actually defining some sort of doctrinal statement about, you know, something along the lines of, you know, total depravity or any other concept like that? That does not seem to jive with how Jesus operates within his teachings. Right. And I would say, I don't think it actually jibes with a lot of what we see in our other parts of scripture as well. But to be fair, surely you can see how one might see that kind of thing in here, in this text. I see it. I totally get it. However, I I, I don't exactly agree with it. And it doesn't mean that we people sincere followers can't disagree. Of course we do. We always do. But it doesn't work for me. From my perspective, Jesus isn't saying, or maybe better, he isn't communicating right here in this spot that you as a human are utterly incapable of any good work. That's the fruit he's talking about in and of yourself. I I just, I just don't think he's saying that. He's saying that you are incapable of of being a useful fruit producing branch and because of that you will therefore end up being thrown away those branches that get thrown away do you think they do they have not a single grape on them well probably not but they probably don't have many and they're probably you know not big and juicy and all that right that's why they're being thrown away now 
I would even argue that from creation, we were capable of choosing his will or our own, and that that hasn't changed. This is, this is the continuing story of humanity. Paul talks of it this way. In fact, you know what, Samuel, why don't you read this out loud for everybody? Romans chapter 2, verse 14. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. Okay. Samuel, how on earth do they do that? How do Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires? How is that even possible? If it is completely impossible without being actually, you know, saved, Holy Spirit, or maybe go to the point God does it, in, you know, uh, how is that possible? It's, it seems like there's at least a little bit of tension right there. Mm-hmm. This is the image of a branch producing, you know, some fruit. And I don't know, was it intentionally? I don't know. Accidentally? I don't know. Is it just the idea of like a blind squirrel finding a nut? I don't know. Maybe. But it's that it's that branch that God takes away. And so, anyway, back to, I said we were going to come back to abiding, just a little bit about that. To be a useful fruit producing branch, we must remain stable and fixed on our master, our teacher, his words, his ways. As we imitate him, we should continue to pray to be like him. Those are the kind of prayers that God's going to answer, for sure. It doesn't even mean he wouldn't answer others, whatever, but I mean, these are the ones that you can count on. As we become like him, even our prayers will be more like his. And what I mean is they will be in agreement with his character, his nature, etc. And God will answer anything in, in that kind of realm, in that sort of world, whatever. And, and Jesus adds a, a very plain and direct truth. If you bear much fruit... And that would be by truly loving God and man, by abiding in him, okay? That, that will prove that you are his disciples. And then the question is, Samuel, prove it to whom? Uh, The world or God himself? You know what? Those are two good possible answers. I think the important part of that is, yeah, I think it proves it to God. It's, it's that whole thing of sheep versus goat, wheat versus tare. It proves, and in the sense that it proves it to the world, well, that glorifies God. Uh, actually, it glorifies God both ways. So uh, just a side note here. Again, people, if anybody's getting hung up on that God will answer anything or whatever, you know that we're trying to put that in a box, even though the, the word sounds like, oh my gosh, it's anything. Just, just think about it this way. If God answered anything and everything you asked. Well, that would make him our servant. He'd be like a genie, cosmic bellhop. The point is, we would be God at that point. And that just doesn't make any sense. He's answering when your requests are are in line with his will, etc. So anyway, Samuel, I said I was going to try to make some of this short. That didn't work out on that one, did it? <laughs> what do you got? Yeah, the, um, I feel like you're touching on this dynamic that we see in the world of good acts, good deeds, goodness itself being present within the world, within people, who are not aligned with the God of Israel and his standards, his story, his mission. And I think that we should remind ourselves that that is a direct effect of the divine image being present for all humanity. Like all human beings have the capability to mirror, to imitate God and his characteristics and lean into that good inclination that we have. A, an analogy that I was thinking of is like, what what do you do with that potential in your life? 
who's instructing you to either maximize or minimize that potential of good. So thinking of Michael Jordan, you know, arguably one of the best basketball players of all time, I'm sure that he was born with some kind of intrinsic talent for the game itself. But if you think about his life and his career, I don't think he would have been the player that he turned out to be if he did not have good coaches around him. In college, he had Dean Smith. That's one of the best college coaches ever. In the pros, he had Phil Jackson. That's also one of the best coaches ever. Those coaches helped shape him, refine him, take those characteristics that they saw intrinsically with him as a player yeah. and help mold him to be the best version of himself on the court that he could. In the same way, Jesus is arguing we all have that n- that nature to perform goodness in our lives, but without God's instruction, without seeing it, and in this case, Jesus is embodying it, like it, it's not going to be very efficient. And that's what gets at the the branches being cut out. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was just thinking of that, and I don't know if that image helps, but... Yeah. Well, here's one more thing. What else did Michael Jordan do that made him the best of all time? I mean, he was a ridiculous uh, in the amount of preparation he put in. Yeah, he worked his butt off. And I think that's a great image. How can we be better Christians? <laughs> Work our butts off at it. And and people, I'm sure there are people that heard that and they're like, oh, come on, that's, you know, that's not Christianity. I'm saved. I've been released. for, Yeah. How about you try and image him. And and how about, I don't know, you join in Jesus's death where you and your life don't matter anymore so that you can join him in his resurrected life where you are the image of God. You're a new creation. You actually are, you know, doing the very things that humans were created to do at B. That's going to take work. <laughs> and And it's not, does your work save you, Samuel? Nope. No, God did all of that work. This is our response to him. It's, uh, yeah, it's a good thing. All right, sorry, anything else? No. All right, Uh, let's look. Uh, We're still in John chapter 15. Let's go to verses 9 through 11. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Okay. Again, there's probably parts of this that sound kind of familiar because we talked recently Jesus, he's kind of using some, it's almost like formulaic speech here, and I'm not usually a fan of formulas, but, you know, we're going to go with how he's, how he's saying it here. God the Father has loved me in a specific way. This is Jesus talking. God the Father's loved me in a specific way. I have loved you in that same way. You should abide in my love and in turn love one another the same way. So there's a receiving side to this, allowing him to love you, accepting it, however you want to term that. But there's also the the giving away, the active side. And that active side, as we've said, it's remaining stable and fixed on his instruction, his example, and actually doing it. Jesus continues the formula. If you keep his commandments, you are abiding in his love. And that is to say, you are continuing in his love. You are staying connected to him. And we might even say that that is through the Spirit. Now, Jesus even adds that he is doing the exact same thing when he's keeping God's commandments. We've already talked about how it is that, okay, Jesus's commandments and God's commandments, I mean, they're one and the same. Jesus's life 
is a more practical and relatable example to follow, but they are in every way the same. Now, Jesus states that it is abiding in the Father's love, and that is to say, it's keeping his commandments that is the source of his joy. Now, think about that. The source of Jesus' joy is in keeping his commandments, abiding in the Father's love. He wants us to have that same joy, and he wants us to have it to the full. Well, Samuel, doesn't take rocket scientists to figure this out. How would we do that? Keeping his commandments? Yeah, the same way that he did it, right? Abiding in his love, keeping his commandments. Again, Jesus, now remember, Jesus is talking to his disciples. So for them, life in the covenant, keeping the commandments, I mean, that is like seriously practical and everyday kind of stuff. This is real stuff. But we can extend this out to us. We can look in, again, we don't look at the Torah as simply a set of rules and keeping Torah as just rule keeping, but it's looking into what is it that God is teaching us about his nature and character in those rules, and how can we actually make that a part of our everyday lives. So we extend that same thing to us, keeping his commandments in that fashion, and he grants us peace. You can go read about that, John chapter 14, verse 27. And not only does he grant us peace, he's now granting us joy. And Samuel, how joyous is that? Huh? (laughs) Mega joy. That's right. So what do you got there? I guess I'm trying to think Hebraically what Jesus is meaning when he says joy may be in you and that joy may be full. Like from a Jewish perspective, what Mm -hmm. does joy look like and how does that reflect our emotions, our thoughts, our actions? Practically, what does that look like from a Hebrew perspective? Because I know that us being Western, joy and happiness can be kind of confused in terms of what secular happiness is. And I'm just trying to get more to the root of what biblical joy means. Yeah. Well, I don't know that I could speak to it from uh, like a Jewish perspective or anything, but I'll just give you my thoughts, my ideas about it. Humans, as a general rule, and we go about it in all kinds of crazy ways, but we all seem to want to be, I don't know, you could use a lot of different words here, fulfilled, complete, other things people would say like, I'm fulfilling my purpose, I don't know, stuff like that, right? Humans, we want to know that we matter, our life matters, that we're, that we're, involved in something worth doing. And sometimes people, I mean, they do horrible, awful things, but they're still, everybody's kind of pursuing the same thing. In the end, the only way for us to be truly fulfilled, and it sounds so counterintuitive, in a way, it not only fulfilled, but also true liberty. That's another thing that we always seek. We, We want that liberty. But the only way to get that is by submitting ourselves to God, his will, his ways, choosing his will over our own. Sounds completely backwards, but it is in that. If we would be willing to do that, lay down our own lives, lay down our own will, raise, elevate his will above our own, all of that. If we would do that, it's at that point when we would actually feel complete. We would feel free. We would feel fulfilled, uh, all of those things. And so that, to me, is the joy that he's talking about. There's no other way to know it, no other way to have it. But anyway, I don't know. That's what I got. Yeah, I mean, it adds complexity to it. It's not something singular or 
something that you can encapsulate in a single statement. It it's kind of a full embodiment of your life and purpose and convictions and motivations and everything. Yeah, most people think of joy as a fleeting emotion. Oh, joy, rapture, but it's not. It it is. I mean, if you could take whatever those emotions are, like what we think of as joy and happiness, contentment, peace, all of those things, if you could wrap those up and say, no, 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 that's actually, it's it's more like what I've become or who I've become, that's, I think, the joy that we're talking about. We'll We'll know it, we'll truly know it fully in the resurrection, but, you know, mm. we pursue it now. Yeah. Anything else? Not at this moment. All right. Keep making progress. Boy, these are big sections, right? Uh, All right, still in John, chapter 15. This is verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. All right, again, much like the first section we did today, not only does it sound like we've got repeat stuff in there, but it actually, even within itself, it sounds a little bit repetitive or something. So, uh, what do we got? Earlier, this was called a new commandment. Uh, here, he's he, he, he just got done speaking of his own commandments, plural, and now he just says, here is my commandment, singular. So, if you are trying to take all of this super literally, you're going to get tied up in knots and it's going to be kind of hard. So, you got to go, what is it that Jesus is trying to communicate? Anyway, what is that commandment that he's talking about here? It's love one another as I have loved you. Jesus loved them perfectly. And how did he do that, Samuel? By keeping God's commandments. Therefore, we should do the same for one another or to one another. And it's not just rule keeping. It's the true meaning, the justice, the mercy, etc. All of that that lies behind it. Any way that we can see it applies to us, humanity, generally. Now, Jesus, uh, well, he kind of greats, he states the greatest example of love that we can show for a friend is to lay down our life for them. Now, I think everybody, we, we can imagine that. There's some part of us that can relate to that in some way. Jesus is saying it, and it's kind of cool because it is literally something that he is about to do. But this goes far beyond the literal. In elevating others, serving others, etc., we are laying down our lives for them. It's something we can do all day, every day, and we should. And so we are laying down our life for a friend. Now, I thought about this as well. You know, Samuel, there's a big difference between having a friend and being a friend. I hear lots of people talk about all the friends they have. Oh, my gosh, with social media, that's another thing. You know, how many friends do you have, right? Quote, unquote, friends, all that. To be Jesus's friend, we must keep his commandments. He has opened the doorway to friendship He elevates us from servant to friend by letting us in on all that God is saying to him. 
And uh, think about it. We've talked about all kinds of things on this podcast, everything from prioritizing alleviating suffering on uh, uh, over the Sabbath or, you know, I- I'm going to be, I-, I am that suffering Messiah. And, of course, we know he's spoken a little bit of his return. Now, going back to first century lingo, uh, the teacher-disciple relationship that we talk about all the time, well, this was also very commonly called the master-slave relationship. Not like indentured servant or, or, you know, purchased slave or any of those kind of things that we talk about, but it's a teacher-student, teacher-disciple. It was also called master-slave. But now he calls them friend. And this is kind of like Abraham was t- uh, referred to as a friend of God. And what did God do? God filled him in on his plans. Remember, uh, God came down with a couple of his buddies. Abraham invites him in, cooks a meal, even though he just circumcised himself. Well, he didn't really cook it so much, but he was running around trying to get people busy, whatever. And then God lets him in on his plan for Sodom. So a similar kind of thing there. So we we can be his friend, but you have a role in that. And then Jesus says something weird, and people take this out of context a lot. Jesus says, remember, I chose you. I chose you, mortal. Okay, now specifically, who is Jesus talking to right here, right at this point, Samuel? He's talking to his disciples. Yeah, this was written not to us, but for us, okay? But I'm just saying, it's right, I think, it is right for us to extend this talk to us. Jesus also chooses us. But let's go back to what was actually happening here. Jesus was going against convention. He was going against what was normal because he chose his own disciples. And that's very relevant here. Side note, it's also kind of like God chose Abraham. Interesting parallel there. Now, I'm sure that back in the first century in the surrounding time, whatever, I'm sure it happened on occasion, but it was much more normal, at least from a cultural perspective. It was like the norm for a disciple to choose their teacher. And of course, yeah, the teacher had to accept them. There was always some mutual aspect to it, yes. But the norm was for the disciple to choose the teacher. Is uh, Jesus, though, he, he chose them. Now, the question, is Jesus here in the middle of his speech, is he making some sort of doctrinal statement about certain humans being chosen, you know, from before creation? Now, obviously, just like what we talked about before, can you see that kind of sort of in the text? Well, sure, totally. I mean, yeah, we see it. But I just don't think that that is what is being communicated. In a sense, we are all chosen. But I'm going to say we don't all accept. It isn't a you don't have a choice to accept or not accept. I'm just saying you do have a choice and some don't accept. And and just side note, didn't Jesus say, come and be my disciple to some who actually refused? Well, I think so. Go read Luke chapter 18, verses 18 to 23, just as an example. uh, Another example, didn't some disciples actually leave him? John chapter 6, verse 66. Bum, bum, bum. (laughs) (laughs) 666, right? Did some disciples leave him? Yes. The important part, okay, again, I know people can argue. They know this is, you know, God chose everyone before. No, they didn't. uh, Okay, whatever. I'm not trying to win the argument here today. I'm just telling you this is the way we see it. And the important part, and I think that this is true no matter what you think, the important part is why they were chosen. And, you know, obviously, subsequently, why we are chosen. It's to bear fruit. It's righteousness. We were predestined for what, Samuel? To be conformed to the image of the Son. You can read that in Romans 8, 29. 
We were predestined for adoption. You can read that in Ephesians 1.5. We were predestined for inheritance. You can read that in Ephesians 1.11, etc., etc. If we bear fruit and continue in bearing fruit, the Father will give us what we ask. Again, as long as it's in line with his will, his character, his nature, etc. Jesus offers up a summation of his entire ministry. All that I have commanded, and I think that we should hear in that also uh, all that he has demonstrated, okay? All that I have commanded is so you could imitate me in loving one another. That's the summation. Now, everyone happily agrees with the idea that, oh yeah, we should love one another. To me, the problem is that then we all just kind of do whatever seems good to us. We take that idea of love your neighbor as you love yourself kind of thing. We take it too far. What we do is exactly what happened in the garden. We're defining good and evil for ourselves. We're defining what it means to love one another. To properly love one another, we have to follow the guidance and instruction of Jesus who is merely living out Torah, who is, you know, like the Torah wrapped in a flesh suit or, you know, whatever you want to say, he is the word. And and we have to let God define what loving one another looks like. All right, I'm going to stop there, Sam. What do you got? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that aspect of Jesus calling his disciples friends and you said that you know to be Jesus's friend we must keep his commandments i th- you know what i think another dynamic that complements that which you said is that a true friendship requires effort from both parties right in order for it to be no- nourished and developed and you know, I'm just thinking about my own life with having friendships with people where either one of us or both of us didn't put in the time to be intentional with one another, spend time, communicate, etc. And then the result of that is that we drifted apart as friends and, you know, don't really communicate or hear from one another again. And so I think in the same way with Jesus, it, it requires like you know, intentionally spending time with him, things yes. that he has said, his life, yes. learning about him, like trying to converse with him in, you know, through prayer, etc. And another thing that came to mind is that typically, I think this is true for most of human history, that friendships seem to naturally happen when the two parties share similar convictions values ideals like it it doesn't make sense for me to be friends with someone who likes kicking puppies or (laughs) stomping on cats or whatever like (laughs) right (laughs) and so in the same way it's like jesus's values in his life was you know performing the commandments of his father to promote justice mercy forgiveness redemption in the world so if you want to be a friend of jesus those are the values that jesus prioritizes so are you going to like agree with those values and try to do the same or are you not so um i don't you know those are things that are going through my head when i'm thinking about jesus and the relationship dynamic with being his friend with my own life and what friendship looks like Yeah, think about a statement. I mean, this comes from your scripture as well. It says, two are better than one. Okay, is that just always true, Samuel? Hey, if you got two people, it's better than having one. (laughs) No. Yeah. It can be disastrous. Two are better than one when they work in cooperation, agreement, etc. You know, the very thing that you just described. So, yeah, I don't know. It's a good point. Anything else from here? Not that I can think of at the moment. All right. Yeah, it's kind of weird because on one hand, we're throwing a lot out all at once. And at the same time, we've kind of already covered some of these things. So it's uh, let's just keep moving. 
I think we can do one more section. This is John chapter 15. We're looking at verses 18 through 25. Woo. Here we go. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Whew, that's a lot of stuff. (laughs) So, all right, what do we got going on in here? Again, you can hear lots of similarities with things we've covered before. Jesus offers a warning. You know, the world, and, and that is to say the majority of humans, well, they hate me because I'm different. Jesus is new worldly if you know what I'm saying. And they're going to hate you in the same way. Now, I, this would be Paul here on the podcast, I also offer you a warning. Uh, Make sure that they're hating you because you're actually like Jesus. If they hate you because you really are just a goofy weirdo, some sort of religious nut, that's okay, that's just a waste. And you're giving God a bad name, so stop it. Their rage against you should be because of their internal stress of experiencing the goodness they know they are drawn to, called to, and they are knowingly refusing, which is to say they don't know God. It shouldn't be their rage against you just because you're an irritating freak, okay? (laughs) If the world loves you, well, you might want to rethink your life. They only love you when or because you are like them. So don't be like the world. Also, don't be some sort of goofy, weirdo, irritating freak. Instead, be like Jesus. And then if the world hates you, all right, I think you probably got something good going on. Now, this is true. It's going to be true for everyone, everywhere, at all times. Uh, The same kind of people that persecuted Jesus, well, they're going to persecute you. And when I say you, me, us, right? All through time, the disciples in his day, all of the centuries in between. But they're going to do that if you are like Jesus, which sounds completely weird. When you actually really love the way God loves, well, yeah, people are now going to hate you. (laughs) Whatever. (laughs) But it, it appears to be true. Now, Jesus adds in a similar way, the same kind of people that listened to him, heard him, kept his word. Well, there is some good news. They will also keep their word, the disciples, or our word, if we're you know, faithfully relaying his teaching and his example, etc. So it's not all bad. Not every single person on earth is going to hate you, only those who are unwilling to actually make that step toward God. It's just those who want to reject God, well, they're going to reject you too. So anyway, it says that they would not have been guilty of sin. Well, let's just go to the extreme here for a second, Samuel. Are we saying that these guys would have been sinless if Jesus hadn't shown up? I don't think so. 
<laughs> of course, no. The point is that they wouldn't have been guilty of this particular sin of unbelief. Now, they probably would have been guilty of other unintentional sin, right, at whatever. And that is just to say that purity, forgiveness, atonement would have still been necessary. And, and you see that, oh, such a great example of that all in the temple system. But he's simply saying there would, there would have been no direct guilt. Now, ignorance wasn't an outright excuse, but even in the Old Testament, the temple system, all that kind of stuff, ignorance was in fact treated differently and I should say, in some cases. So they would not have been guilty if they had not seen and heard Jesus in real life. There was some measure of ignorance that they could have, I don't know, rightfully claimed or that God would have rightfully, you know, uh, accounted to them or, you know, whatever. But in this case, they can feign ignorance no more. The whole of Torah, all of it, was made known to them in his very life. And they now have guilt in the matter. They saw his life. They saw his works. Some things that had never been seen by humans before. And they rejected him. They hated him. They hated him without cause. And that's a fulfilling of the scripture, what Jesus was referring to. It actually appears in a couple places. You could look at Psalm chapter 35, verse 19, or Psalm chapter 64, verse 4. But what we're talking about here is baseless hatred. They hated him without cause, baseless hatred. And in hating him, they hated the Father. Sort of the ironic, the ironic turn in all of that is that Jesus lived out baseless love. The exact opposite. They love without cause. Jesus loved without cause. And that is what he commands us to do. Now, of course, this is all very specific to this generation and these eyewitnesses. We are not talking about all Jews for all time. And and I would even say this. Bring this into the modern day. Modern Jews, and, and Samuel, you know, we've talked about this before, at least personally. I don't know if we've ever talked about it in the podcast. Modern Jews, they're really only rejecting a caricature of Jesus. They're not rejecting the real guy. Whatever it is they think they know, it's what they've got from Christianity in the church, and it's really not a very good picture of who he was. If they could see his real self really see him for who he was. I'm convinced that they would embrace him. But not only do they get a bad image, we also know that there's that partial hardening. They can't really see clearly. So it, anyway, what we're talking about here, right here in this text, this verse, this is not all Jews forever. This was this generation and these eyewitnesses. One final point. I don't know if you noticed when you're reading through he called the law their law. Now, some would look at this and go, oh, see, Jesus doesn't, he, he's, he's getting rid of the law. That's just their thing. They keep holding on to it. I would say, uh, no, that's not at all what he's talking about here. The people he's talking to, these leaders, this is specifically referring to those who had responsibility for Torah and its application and its interpretation, etc. And we would be talking about the Sanhedrin. Of course, it was Jesus' Torah, too. It was the disciples' Torah, too. It was all Israel's, all Jews' Torah, too. But then, notice what else happens. He calls it Torah, but he's quoting out of the Psalms. And so, you know, if somebody's trying to get really technical, they'll say, oh, well, the Torah is the first five books of the of, of the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures. And it's like, yeah, you're absolutely right. But it was also very common to just call all of scripture Torah. Because Torah doesn't actually mean law. Torah means instruction. And so all of scripture is good for instruction, right, Samuel? 
Mm -hmm. And that's true before Jesus was on the scene. It's true while Jesus is on the scene. It's true after Jesus was on the scene. So it's today, whatever. It's all it's all good. All right, Samuel, I'm going to stop there. You got anything on that part? Just that, uh, man, this this section can be so problematic for people who wind up interpreting Jesus' words as the nation of Israel. Like, whenever he says, like, uh, he's speaking about those who hate me, and people turn that around to say that, you know, look, it was the the Jews, it was Israel as a whole that rejected Jesus, and that's what led to the establishment of the, quote-unquote, the church that yeah. went outside of Israel. And then this thing that you said right here about their law, I think that this section is a perfect example of why we do this podcast to showcase the context. It's like, think about it. Like, Jesus of course had enemies, people who did not agree with the image of who Jesus was showing himself to be as Messiah. Yeah. But he also had followers. He had people who believed and exactly. like agreed to his his gospel, his good news of repentance and kingdom coming. And we have to keep that in mind that well and let's go back to the vine aspect if 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 Jesus is saying that he is the true vine and we said that Jesus is a representative of all of Israel and we we said that the vineyard was Israel and we had that aspect in previous verses where branches are being cut, pruned so that more fruit, fruit can be produced if there if Israel is being completely taken out of the picture that vine imagery, you would uproot the entire vine and replace it with, you know, a, a different plant or a different vine. But that's not the case. Like the the original vine is still present. It's just you're you're taking off the individual ones that are not aligning with the purpose of bearing fruit. Right. And then we get this picture later in the scriptures where. There are grafting in, there are branches that are added to the original right. vine in order to bear fruit. Um, so, I don't know, I just wanted to say that, that this is just a great case study of okie dokie most to help people, <laughs> you know, return to the original context for why Jesus is saying the words that he is. Yeah, yeah, we have to get that image in our head that as, you know, Gentile believers, I mean, we're, we're, we're not Israel, we are joining into the commonwealth of Israel. We're not replacing it. So that's a good image. I thought of another thing, Samuel, this idea about their law. And I'm going to relate that to a modern phrase, your truth. Hmm. There is no your truth. There's only the truth. But in the same way, Jesus is saying, yeah, you've got your way of seeing the law and it's led you to reject me, hate me, reject God, etc., hate me, all of that. Well, that's their law, their truth, as opposed to the real truth, God's truth. You know what I'm saying? That's another mm -hmm. way we could look at that as well. So this is uh, it's interesting stuff, and, mm -hmm. and I think it pushes people to, to really reevaluate how they view, just, well, honestly, everything. It should. So much of what we think we know is good and right and true, but we've got it, I don't know, it's like we've got all this good, right stuff packaged up in the wrong box or something, you know? And and then if you, you kind of take it out of there and put it back in its correct, proper box, not only is it still good, right, and true, it's like it's on steroids all of a sudden. It makes so mm -hmm. much more sense. It does so much more good, et cetera. It's just good. Yeah. I don't know. Well, anything else before we quit for today, Samuel? I think we're we're good. All right, let's get out of here. Okie dokie. Oh! Thank you for listening to the Okie Dokie Most podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so that you never miss an episode. 
and be sure to leave us a rating and a review to let us know how this content is impacting your life. You can find out more information about the podcast at www.okidokimos.com. And if you'd like to get a hold of us, please send us an email at okidokimos at gmail.com. Until next time, we pray that you will do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We'll talk to you again soon.